God damn it, you accursed. Welcome to the pod. David Hurley here. And if I look at the Zoom squares on my screen, I can see we've got Scott Reed over there and Corey Tonight over there. But cripes, there is no Zoom square for Jordan this week. Fellas, she's traded us in for camping and s'mores and spending quality time with her family before the school year starts. Go figure. What's what with these loser. kids anyway? No kidding. Man, my they, kids are home man, today. They, I just went upstairs, and my son is sitting in a bathrobe watching the Raging Bull. So I'm the gold medal winner at the Shit Dad Olympics. She should try that. Yeah, she says she's going to be back next week. I think we'll have to start doing these things in a tent or something somewhere. Anyway, all right. Here's the show today. We'll jump all over last week's developments in the Green Belt story, including the Premier's presser, new federal polls widening the gap between the Conservatives and Liberals, and more talk about Trudeau as a liability. We'll talk about that. Our cursed clipping is from Christian Pass Lang at cbc.ca. 900,000 international students are coming to Canada this year, a record number, and Minister Miller has concerns about the integrity of our immigration system. After all of that, the great Gordon Pinsent calls for our hey yous. Scott, Corey, who's going to bolster the left flank of this pod today? You both have good uh, credentials. Oh, for me, it'll be me all the way. I promise, Absolutely. Jordan, that I will I will represent the NDP very capably today. Um I hope she's she's happy with with my performance. We'll get feedback next week, I'm sure. I think we could I think we could split it up though. I think that Scott could do the identity cultural politics side of I'd the like NDP cuz he's right in there with that. Yeah. And you could do the working class rural roots social yeah, that's democratic a, uh, NDP. That, that's what I was going to go for. And yeah. uh, and if I do it well, I'll be more popular with my extended family cuz <laughs> many, many, many of them come from that side of the ledger, and I, and I love them for it. So we'll, well try, try, try to make my family happy here. I'm sorry. The whole thing already sounds like I'm being discriminated against, so I'll be filing a complaint with the Ontario <laughs> Human Rights Commission. Ha! This Great. was a microaggression. It was. Mike. I thought, verging on my, macro. Well, get ready. There's some macro ones coming at you later. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's quit laughing because we got to talk about the federal polls. And it's yeah. no fucking laughing matter. Um, so what we saw this past uh, week was another abacus uh, and a couple of other polls all showing, uh, you know, the liberals somewhere between 10 and 13 points down um, and uh, tied in Atlantic Canada, losing by 10 points in the GTHA, losing by 20 points in British Columbia and third uh, it's all pretty disastrous. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, late in a late term government, this is the kind of numbers you expect to see, but then you also expect a certain result at the end of the day. So do the liberals have to do something very different to get back into the game? I haven't noticed coming out of the retreat that they seem to be showing themselves to be different, that they had a cold shower there and they came out of there and they said, we've got to have some different ideas. We've got to have some different comms approaches. So Scott, let me start with you. Um, do they have to, what kind of change do they have to represent now in order to start to stop this momentum? We don't even know where this ends, by the way. 26% for the liberals, which Coletto showed, is just break glass, pull the emergency lever time. Yeah, and... You know, I always remind people whenever you start to see numbers like this, federally or provincially, of what you used to say, David, which was, if the Liberal Party federally is falling beneath the 30% uh, percent mark, uh, it's time uh, to gather and to determine what needs to happen, because something needs to happen. And what's so baffling, and, and we don't know, we're only seeing the outside of the house, we're not seeing the inside, but what appears to be baffling is there's very little indication that Trudeau and the team uh, feel like they need to make any kind of adjustment. And obviously that is incorrect. And, and, um, and it would be a mistake, for example, I think, to assume that, well, we're in tough economic times and these are challenging times and we're an incumbent government. And so what you've got to do is believe in what you're doing as an agenda, as a set of policies, and then just, you know, wait it out and they'll come back. That's not a strategy. Um, and so I, you know, to my mind, when I look at this, I, I think they've got to embrace some change. I think they have to start to actually say, 
here are three things we're focusing on and we're going to really try to move the needle. Here's how we're going to move the needle. Like I start by setting expectations, but most important of all, I would take one step on a ladder. Like, you know, you're not going to fix everything overnight and you're probably not going to fix the big thing. So as an example, they need to talk about housing. They've been fitful and uneven in it. I know we're going to talk about immigration and international students in a minute. And that was a partial response, it seemed. And I've got some criticism of that in terms of the housing issue coming out of last week's cabinet retreat. But I, I think they got to be careful about sort of saying, okay, well, we get how big a, a, an issue housing is, and we're effectively permitting you politically to make that a referendum on whether or not we deserve to get out of jail. Like, I think they, they have to set smaller tests for themselves. They have to identify an issue, move the yardsticks on it, and, and create some success. They need some wins. So I, I would start looking at, you know, where can we, what, what's 26 to 31? And, and, and how do we peel back 2 3% on that? What issues, what messages would unlock that? Let's like start taking this thing in chunks, in steps. And obviously, I think they, you know, they just can't avoid the need to talk, uh, you know, more fluently, more effectively, more compassionately um, uh, about economic issues. And so the final thing I would say is this, and I'm going to throw out a big dime here at the end. Um, I think they need Mark Carney. If I were them, I, I, I'd say, you know what? We need to bolster our economic bench. And this guy's been hovering around for a long time. Put him in the fucking game. You know, free up a seat. Give the guy a chance. Tell people you care enough about the economy that you're going to take one of the big foreheads of them internationally in the economy. I don't know if he's willing in game, but... I would try to throw them in. And if you go, oh, well, you know, you got to think about the politics internally and Freeland and where's that go? And is he finance minister? Like, what? Are, I'd take him in and I'd make him environment minister and say, all right, here's a guy who's talked about net zero, but he's talked about how you can do that using finance and using uh, smart economic paths, like, like whatever. But I would put the guy in the game, show people you're willing to play a card. So I know I said take small steps and that's a big one, but, you know, I, I just think... They got to do something else because what they're doing ain't working and there's no indication that it will start to work. Well, it would seem more liberals uh, every day are thinking about maybe putting somebody else in, but not in that role, not environment, maybe in the main <laughs> seat. Uh, I, the, the grumbling is continuing and and it would seem the volume is, 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 is being turned up. And these polls are only going to going to make that internal problem and uh, that internal questioning of Trudeau's leadership even more acute, in my view. Um, but I, I'll be I'll be the one of the th the three of us here this morning is going to say I'm really fucking excited about the polls. I think they're <laughs> really good. <laughs> I, don't oh, yeah. I don't see this as a problem to be solved. I see this as a moment to be, to be celebrated we with just, great vigor. Ain't that like a liberal? I just assume everyone says crisis is ter terrible in development. <laughs> no, I'm I, I'm quite pleased about it all. Uh, Look, uh, but put your strategist hat on and help the liberals out here. What do they got to do? Well, they got to start talking about and doing things for the middle class. Like you know, this this micro. We talked about this last week, but this micro targeting uh, bullshit uh, continues. And like they come out talking on housing again, and and this week, and it's all small ball shit for uh, with great amounts of means testing associated with it. Uh, which is great if you're Jagmeet Singh because you can say, hey, I'm delivering for, for my base of, of low-income renters and uh, people who are kind of uh, living on the economic margins. Not that there's anything wrong with do doing things f for those folks, but you know we're here to talk about politics, not policy. And the politics of micro-targeting to 10% of the public again and again and again and, and leaving 70% of the public uh, left holding uh, an empty cup is is not a good political strategy and they've got a they got elected in 2015 and saying we're going to be the champions of the middle class i always thought that was a pretty dubious prospect given that you had a nepo baby as a leader uh but you know it, they pulled it off but they're not pulling it off now like what they're pulling off right now is is an nepo baby leading a, a, you know some uh, left-wing social activists uh and what they're leaving behind is the electorate that got them there They've got to figure out how to start uh, talking about things in a way that connects with the middle class. Now, there's limited things, I think, from a, a, on a, a outcomes policy basis that you can do around cost of living and some of these other issues. 
but you got to at least start talking about the problem like, with some degree of empathy uh, and to put yourself as someone standing on, on the side of the middle class, because right now they're not. They're standing on the side of, you know, uh, uh, maybe an important group of people that need help. But uh, but from an electoral perspective, you know, 10 percent plus, you know, your most hardened supporters gets you to 26, apparently. And 26 is, is a good way to get thrown out of office and not just a little bit. Like, you know, we're looking at, you know, potentially Mulroney 88 level numbers here if this slide continues. And and that is devastatingly bad for the Liberal Party. Um, uh, so, you know, it, it's it's not just a change election. It's a change election with a giant exclamation mark and a fuck you at the end of it right now. That's what they're looking at. And I don't understand they what they're it, supposed to do on housing, Corey. I don't understand what they're supposed to do because nothing is going to change substantively in the housing market between now and 2025. <laughs> So I understand, I'm I'm not talking about policy now, there's probably a million policies they should put in place, but politically, there's not going to be a lot more people with affordable housing, with with houses they housing they can afford in 2025 than there are today. Well, you do have time to to see some big things announced in terms of both programs, but also projects, and projects is really, I think, what the more important of the two is. you know, there, there's a roster of projects that are in the pipeline that uh, were p- pulled together. And I think your interview with Keys, Matt, got, got into this on the early burly, uh, that were financed in a different environment uh, that uh, were predicated on, on, on assumptions on the economic side that are no longer present. And there's ways that, that the government could close the gap on those projects. And I would be looking to do that so that those people are standing next to you. Now, the, the challenge with, with that part of it is, is it's once again playing to, to the 10% as opposed to everybody else. But I do think there are things that they could do that they don't want to do, that finance doesn't want to do, like uh, you know, exempting uh, uh, HST. On, yeah, that on was an bills. idea from Keys, Matt. I thought that was pr- pretty yeah, simple but, to communicate, but, pretty easy but, to do. But but it's one that's been on the table from the provinces. You know, some provinces are already doing it or signaling they're going to do it around the PST portion of the HST. Uh, if I were the federal government, I'd be looking at, at getting in on that action. Uh, and we're going to talk about it in a minute, but I think there's a lot of stuff that's uh, uh, you know virtually 100% within their realm around uh, immigration. So if you're looking at we have a shortage of workers and we've got a, a surplus of sort of irregular border crossers. Why isn't the government getting in the game of uh, making sure that there's housing for those people and, and have it be federal housing? They have federal lands, they have federal dollars, uh, they have the ability to get their own construction contracts. Uh, I would, and, and you can do this right away, I would start constructing uh, housing for those people. And, and another group is foreign students. You know, it came, I think, as a shock to me seeing, and I maybe should pause on this, but that we've got 900,000 foreign students in the country right now, triple what it was three years ago. So, you know, if you're going to if you're going to triple the number of foreign students in the market, you better have some fucking housing for them. And, uh, uh, you know, like there, there, there's a bunch of issues. So, here so, where so I much think of it doesn't seem in. like the things were connected. Eh, Corey, it just doesn't seem no, like. No. Well, it, but this gets to the competence issue. It's like, you know, you, you guys have a cabinet like did none of you sit around the table and talk about these things. Do you not go through cabinet committee where you try to look at secondary impacts like this is how every other government functions. And, you know, I'm sure there's an attempt to do that there, but it's it's not an attempt that results in success on on a range of issues, it would appear. And the, and the, this, the student issue is, a, is just another one. Rising cost of living. What's a timelier or more fraught topic than that? I mean, we talk a hell of a lot about its political implications on curse of politics. On the hurly-burly, we dive a little deeper into how it affects us and the potential policy solutions that could help. So I'd like to take just a minute here to explore some brand new inflation data I skimmed by last week. It's from the latest consumer price index. Short story, and I hardly need to tell you this because you feel it every day, is pretty much everything is going up. Gas, groceries, energy, borrowing costs, and more. Prices increased an average of 3.3% year over year in July. Note, that's just the average. Food and other staples, much more than that. But within this larger, how much higher can this possibly go inflationary jag? Prices for cellular services, like those from our presenting sponsor, tell us, decreased. That's what I said, decreased by almost 15% year over year. 
So that's got to be a blip, right? A moment in time. Nope. The longer term trend over the last three years is prices for cellular services are down 33%. So the simple question in the context of constantly escalating cost of living across the board is why, dear Hurley Burleyites, is the price of your cell service de-escalating? The answer isn't so simple. So much so that we'll spend the next few weeks exploring it. But let's start with this. The current market forces at play and government policy that continues to promote investment and innovation, as well as aggressive price competition from TELUS and its facilities-based competitors, is working. Facilities-based carriers like TELUS own, build, operate, and invest in the continued innovation and expansion of a network and its services. There is another model, wholesale wireless resellers, who just parasitically ride the network and resell access to it. They offer a price, but they don't invest, they don't innovate service, and they don't contribute to the greater good. And in other jurisdictions around the world, it has not worked out for consumers. Next week, I'll put some data where my mouth is on that. Stay tuned. Scott, when I talk to liberals, mm. whether they be cabinet ministers or staffers or just activists on the ground, the thing that everybody is clinging to is not that Trudeau is going to pull some rabbit out of his hat and be an amazing campaigner, not that the government's going to turn around and be radically different. What everybody is clinging to is the hope that Canadians will not vote for Pierre Polyev and that he's some sort of uh, unusual and extreme figure that Canadians will recoil from uh, at the end of the day. I'm increasingly suspicious of this. Um, I don't see any evidence of it in the polling. He's now got them up around 38. One poll showed them at 41. Those are pretty big numbers for the modern Conservative Party to be hitting. And um, I noticed that Abacus tested their ad and went over extremely well, including with Liberal and NDP voters, softened a lot of animosity among Liberal and NDP voters. And he improved in the last two weeks, improved his personal standing by eight percentage points. Yeah. Advertising uh, works. I, I did some... Um I did some radio last week and I had David on and he talked a little bit about the focus groups and talked about how the ad played. And and it unfortunately reinforced my assumptions, which when I looked at it, I thought this thing's going to work with their target audiences. You talk about the hope that liberals have that they'll be able to disqualify uh, Pierre Polyev or that he'll disqualify himself. I think that's reflected um, by a fear on the part of conservatives that that could happen, right? That, you know, well, wait a second, is this guy's edge is too sharp? Is he uh, too alienating to women? The difference is that the conservatives are doing something about it and, and it appears that it's effective, right? So they are experimenting with changes in the way he dresses. I don't like all of them, but in the way he dresses and what he says, they've dropped the tag of freedom, you know, brave heart, and they've moved to common sense, which we know played in Ontario a generation ago. Feels to me like it's uh, kind of tailor-made for our times, to be honest. And I don't think there's a copyright on it. I don't think there's any shame in borrowing it uh, if it's effective. Um, and what's not happening, of course, is that the Liberals haven't spent the past year trying to define Pierre Polyev, other than, as we've said repeatedly, uh, every now and then when the Prime Minister himself loses his temper at a microphone and says, hey, fuck, is anyone looking at this guy? Like, come on, right? Well, if you feel that way, why haven't you licensed your team to, you know, put $3 million behind an ad campaign that pound the living piss out of them? Um, so so there's that. I, I, a, a couple of other quick things. You know, Corey raises the point about how liberals are talking and people are so, you know, like and the fear um, about Trudeau staying. I think there's another fear liberals ought to have when I look at these numbers, and that's that he could leave. Because I, I, I look at it and I worry that he'll walk up to the edge of the next election. And, and, and as a lot of politicians will do, and particularly incumbent prime ministers, right up to the edge assuming that he'll be able to uh, magic trick his way out of it and then conclude that it looks bad and bails. Now, I'm hoping that he finds a course correction prior to that, but I think that a great risk for the Liberal Party is that, you know, they stall where they are 
Um, and then increasingly, uh, he just says, okay, I, I'm going to pack it in rather than lose my last election. You kind of have two courses. You can follow sorry, LeBron you, you gotta pay royal. You've got to pay royalty, Scott. I have trademarked that analysis. <laughs> um, it's the Hurley theorem of Canadian politics, which is prime ministers leave when they have concluded they can't win the next election or when they've exactly. lost the election and in no other circumstances. Yeah. And they tend not to conclude that until very late before the day. Mulroney, 93, Trudeau, 84, you know. uh, By the time they come to the conclusion that it is truly uh, curtains, um, it really means that it's over for the party and the opportunity of rejuvenation is effectively uh, nil. McGinty did it well, by the way. I mean, not that the exit was good. I was always reminded of sort of a Saigon in 75, but... um, (laughs) but but he left. He left Kathleen it was a year. Sufficient time. He left Kathleen a year to put her own imprint on a government. Yeah. Right. So. And, and I'm not advocating that he leave. I, I mean, I'm still a voice out there that says uh, stay and improve uh, rather than uh, bail and hope, because I I don't have a lot of hope for the other prospects, um, and I don't. I th- let me put it this way. I think the Trudeau. A combination of putting the boots to Polyev, shifting some of his focus, and campaigning effectively, particularly in connecting with Quebecers, still offers them that 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 combination of prescriptions is a better possible outcome for the Liberal Party than what just about any of the other pretenders can conjure. I just don't see them being able to put together the same um, same recipe. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe some, maybe we'll have a race and somebody will blow the living wheels off me. I don't know. So I posted some numbers on LinkedIn this weekend uh, just to provide some context for these polling numbers. There's lots of context that could be provided around them. But two years before the 1988 federal election, oh, yeah. which the Mulroney government won a majority in, they were in third place consistently for like a year and a half. They were in third place and they were... 15 to 20 points behind the leading party. Sometimes that was the Liberals and sometimes that was the NDP. They won in two ways. There's two keys to their victory. One of which is there was an issue on the table that superseded all previous political disputes, free trade. So free trade made all the other stuff that people had been judging the government on irrelevant and said, now we have to choose about this. So it wasn't a referendum on them, it was a referendum on free trade. Second thing is, they destroyed Turner, right? In the old Alan Gregg terminology, they bombed the bridge. And so that was that formula. Feels to me like that is the formula. Corey? It, it's only, that's, that's always the formula, I think. Yeah. Like if, if, you're, if you can't win a, uh, an election on the basis of your record, and your own popularity or your you know partisan affiliation or you know like it's summation of all of those things you've got to find a bigger issue and we've seen uh, other examples of, of that where uh, sometimes it's an issue that's put on the table by the opposition by the way and uh, you know I, I I look to the firing of a hundred thousand uh, workers in uh, uh, mm-hmm. 2014 as, as something that became a polarizing issue or if you go back, before it's you know very oddly with with John Tory that uh, religious schooling and uh, you know statements mm-hmm. about you know whether evolution is a theory or not like this is you know it's almost cartoonish <laughs> it's almost cartoonish when you go back and think about it but um, uh, but those are opposition you know issues that got put on the uh, electoral table uh, right before a campaign that then ended up superseding the unpopularity of the incumbent. Uh, but there, there are options for this government to uh, put other things on the table as well. But it's hard to see this tired and 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 weary group of people in cabinet and uh, uh, and within their organization as as coming up with any bold thinking on anything. Like it seems to be uh, incrementalism if necessary. Uh, but if we could do something less than that, we will. <laughs> like it's it's. Uh, you know, you're, bold is not exactly the term that I would I would use to describe uh, the last four or five years of this government. Like I think they came in with bold around things like uh, carbon taxes and a number of other issues, but it's been a long time since we've seen something uh, with that sort of clarity and poignancy coming out on the policy side. 
Yeah. I mean, I just, I mean, I, I think that I have a tendency, and I got to check myself on this. I have a tendency when I see this situation to focus entirely on the liberals and what they're doing wrong. But I think that we have to, at this point, concede that Pauliev is doing some things right. And sure. that... Yeah. Um, and that there is evidence that he is resonating personally with some members of the population, larger than may have been anticipated by some of us. Uh, and it isn't just unhappiness with the government; it's an interest in him and what he has, and what he has to offer. And I, I am deeply skeptical. Somebody tell me I'm wrong. I'm deeply skeptical that people in the next election are going to care about the convoy and his shenanigans around the convoy. So when liberals yeah. say that to me, he was at the convoy and all that stuff, I'm just thinking, I don't know that anybody even remembers that or cares about that anymore. Well, I, I would say there's pretty good data points that they don't. And 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 one of them being like on any of this rear view mirror pandemic related stuff, like, look, it, it was an unfortunate time that was unpleasant for almost everyone who went through it, if not everyone who went through it. Uh, it's something that people want to not think about very much. They don't want to talk about it. It defined every conversation in all of our politics for almost three years, and nobody wants to go back. And uh, you know, so uh, add in that elections are always more about the future than they are the past. So I think you already got a big knock against going back there to begin with, just on sort of baseline gravity of politics, sort of sort of things. And then uh, I, I would put a multiplier on that <laughs> in terms of. People really don't want to go back to, to, to places and times where things were, were particularly divisive, whether it's within their own family uh, or the politics generally, but it, it defied all of that. And, and you look at you know, the, the Ford re-election as is, is being, a, you know, I think, a great example of this. Uh, the guy who locked down the province repeatedly and made you know, my friend Jenny and many other people quite upset with him um, uh, ended, up, ended up all coming and voting for him. And uh, uh, almost without exception. And, and, you know, when you look at, look at those numbers, you know, the sort of PPC style voters, they either stayed home or they went and voted for Ford. And it wasn't, they were not 6%, they were at 2 So it's, uh, uh, you know, I, I think all of that leads me to believe that the convoy stuff is just a wet firecracker. It's not going to go anywhere. And I agree with you, David. I think they're doing a lot of things right. But one of them is like listening to the research around um, needing to, to file some of the sharp edges to soften his appeal, to make him look a little bit more normal and every day, uh, getting rid of the, you know, the uh, 1770s uh, militiaman theme of freedom with your fist and the one in the air on one side and a musket in the other. Like this is, <laughs> that, this is not, you know, a traditional Canadian campaign slogan, even on the right, even on the far right. But, you know, what is, is common sense. What, what is, is we're going to be, uh, the voice and 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 the uh, arms and legs of the middle class to try to get some things done for them and to to really ally yourself with with that part of the electorate and to uh, show common cause and sympathy with them and I think that when Polyev has been moving up that's what he's been doing and uh, whether it's around cost of living or or interest rates or uh, even things around sort of the excesses and entitlement in government, it, you know, uh, or even government competence. It's like, you should be able to get a passport in a timely way. You should be able to do this or that. But these are very, you know, man on the street, woman on the street interactions that they have with the government saying that the government has to do better. Like, so I, I agree. They're doing a bunch of things smart. And, you know, what you're seeing is uh, that the numbers are continuing to march in that direction. And uh, at the end of that road is oblivion for the Liberal Party if they're not careful. So, as you may have heard, the strike that shut down British Columbia's ports is over, and the resulting backlogs are being cleared. Our sponsor, CN, announced last week that it is now current, meaning up-to-date, at the ports of Vancouver and Prince Rupert. Labour Minister Seamus O'Regan deserves the praise he's enjoyed for helping bringing about a settlement. Triangulating between the needs of business, the national economic interest, and the rights of workers is no cakewalk. But it's worth repeating, without assigning blame, the shutdown should never have happened in the first place. No single group should have the power to trigger or provoke what amounts to an economic nuclear option. Choking off two of the most important gates in Canada's supply chains at a time when the country is coping with continuing disruptions abroad was an act of severe self-harm. 
Which brings us to another development the federal government has made clear is in the offing, something that will profoundly disrupt the collective bargaining process. As part of its deal with one of the opposition parties for support in Parliament, the government intends to give organized labor the absolute right to shut down operations of any federally regulated company. CN is, of course, one of those companies. It continues to build respectful relationships with the unions representing its workers. Its guiding principle is to do what's right for the company and for its employees. But the foundation of that relationship is a balance. Unions can walk away from the bargaining table and call a strike. The company may then continue operations as best it can, but no employer wants to withstand such disruption. The whole system is meant to encourage a negotiated settlement. Now, though, the government proposes banning replacement workers. That will give one side a powerful tool and remove incentive to keep negotiating. In CN's case, being forced to shut down would instantly jam Canada's supply chains, which is just plain bad for every single Canadian. As I've said here before, just about everything moves by train at some point. The status quo works. The legislation contemplated in Ottawa would end that. It is in neither the interest of the economy nor of individual Canadians. Scott, maybe the well, reason well, they haven't gone maybe the reason they haven't gone after Polyev is because they don't have they haven't established what their core critique of him is. I think that's right. But you know when you'll find out that core critique? When you commission research and say, let's sit down and we're gonna have an ad in the next forty-eight uh or the you know the next uh, four weeks, and then let's force ourselves to concentrate, um, and we'll let the research tell us what works. Like I, I, you guys are really zeroing in on the convoy as though that's the only uh, potential way to get under his armor. I think there's probably other routes. Like I agree with you, it's too late on the convoy, or it feels like its political value beyond heart, those who would already be hardcore against him is diminishing. Um, it's one of the reasons I really wanted them. I wanted them to start going negative even before he became leader. Like I thought, well, that was fresh in people's minds. While it was at a point where that issue was dividing opinion and driving opinion, I thought they should have labeled him and defined him and really made him wear it. And we know what he's like. He's, you know, he'll go G Gordon Liddy and keep his hand over the candle. So like I would have forced him to keep his hand over the candle. And um, I, uh, I just think... That now what they've got to do is exactly what you say, David. They have to find out what the core critique is and then sort of say, what are the three, four most resonant levers? And, you know, fundamentally, there's, you know, there's there's a core science to this. You know, the, you say, well, I want him to be on the wrong side of issues that matter to people. Uh, who will decide the election. And I want them to not only think that he doesn't share their view on that, but that that then means that he doesn't share their worldview on a whole pile of things. So I can't trust him with the whole broad basket full of issues that we can't predict might land on his desk as prime minister because he obviously doesn't uh, guide by the same compass as me. And so, you know, it's equally, it's equal parts issue, and character and what that issue tells you about character, you know, like I just and I think there are ways. Let me you, know, you lock me in a room with some research and some money. I, I, I'd love the challenge of putting together uh, like I would fucking relish the job of putting together the hammer on him. Uh, so I don't think that's beyond the can of mortals, but they haven't shown any indication that they have a desire to do it. And uh, by the way, I just want to come back to your earlier point about having us, you know, trying to get an issue that supersedes it, you know, Corey was instinctively reaching towards provincial elections that the challenge, and I agree that it's, and I've brought this up in the past. I think it's a route that they should examine, but like, it doesn't just happen. Like, First of all, it happened in 1911, 1974, 1988. I stand to be corrected by historians, but it hasn't happened that often in Canada. Two of those examples are free trade. Right. Like and and two of those examples are to borrow a point that uh, Corey made. Two of those examples hinged on proposals that came from the opposition. And so, you know, the um, I just think, you know, you, they've got to look and see like what what is their they can't count on the idea that. Polly will propose wage and price controls or religious school funding or fire 100,000 people on your way. Deep to historical the reference for those not born in 1974. Look it up. So I, you know, I, I think they have to, I think they have to build toward that. So you have to start thinking now, well, what could, what could be an issue that will overwhelm 
everything else. Um, but that also matters to people. And, uh, you know, they're not, <laughs> it's easy to say, well, that's how to win the election, but those things aren't easy to come by. Sometimes you sort of bumble into them by accident. Mulroney didn't start the election cycle in 1988, thinking that he was going to make it a referendum on uh, free trade. He, he, he over time discovered that in the weeks and months leading up to it. And then obviously during the campaign. Um, he was opposed to it in 84, was he not? He was. Yes, he was. He was. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but he ran against anyway, the leadership. So, John Crosby was in favor of it. Hmm. Well, anyway, well, I just think, um, I think they got to get firing on all those things. But most important of all, I think they have to they have to show people that they're willing to change, that they get that they've got to actually uh, move it. And they cannot get around the issue of the economy. Uh, like They just can't. Yep. I, so I, 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 I get the, I you get for the a sense. Sense. We'll go ahead, Corey. Yeah. Sorry, I just I get the sense that that you know there's the, there's this notion, and I've heard this suggested by some of my liberal friends out there that that they are waiting for uh, Polyev to reveal his platform, and then that's going to provide uh, the wedge that they need. Well, uh, long gone are the days of putting out your platform a year in advance, and and you know. Uh, Jenny Burns no dummy, as your audience knows, and Polyev's no dummy, uh, as those who've worked in Parliament with him will know. Uh, you don't have to do that. You don't have to put out a platform at all. And in fact, you can you can have you know five priorities. You can keep it very thin uh, and uh, and deny uh, the, the the liberals the opportunity to to grab the particulars of your climate change plan and use them to beat you to death with it. And and we've seen that. They don't you know, have to, can I just interrupt you, Corey? Just confirm something that I believe, which is the conservatives could leave guns out of their platform entirely and not lose any votes. Yeah, I think you could leave the platform out of the platform entirely. And right. Uh, and you're and you're fine. Like you know, in uh, 2018, we didn't put out a platform, as you know, David. Like I think we, day before the election, we cobbled something together. But uh, you know, prior to that, it was, the notion was always, well, we need to see your fully costed platform, and and you know, maybe because we're you know we're a little bit too on the spectrum over here in the Conservative Party, we uh, we're like, oh yes, math. You asked us for math. Great. Let's let me get out my calculator. <laughs> I'm going to tabulate all these columns, and then I'm going to hand to you. Uh, the set of, of weapons to beat me to death with in a campaign. No, you don't have to do any of that fucking shit. Like, you know, you need to have a clear set of priorities and you have to have clarity around your mo motive. Um, but look, I, I want to do a Hang little- Hang on, uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Can I, before you move off of that yeah. point, because I think, I think that you got to be really careful of next war, last war. Um, what you're saying is actually kind of a last war mentality, right? I think it's become conventional wisdom in- um, in, in, in political circles that you're better off without a platform, that you actually are better off on just running on a handful of priorities, that that leaves you less vulnerable. And that's particularly uh, sound policy and strategy for, uh, for, for conservatives. I would just say, though, that that creates vulnerabilities too. And what we haven't seen is someone do a really effective job of countering a campaign that's built around that. So one of the things that I would be doing in the corner of campaign headquarters, if I were the liberals, would be thinking about how would you exploit that opportunity if, if that's the course that the conservatives pick? And, and I'll give you a, a further thought on that. Um, the mistake that people make when they're running against those kinds of campaigns is in the campaign itself, when obviously the incumbent is desperate and they're way down in the polls, they start inventing what the platform must actually be for the party that doesn't have a platform. And they spend time at the microphone saying, you can't elect these guys because they won't tell you what their real agenda is. They won't tell you what they, what they think about. And the argument I would make is you want to start doing that well in advance of the campaign because it gets discounted during the election campaign because you look desperate and people just think, well, you're only saying that to save your own bacon. So how do you lay track if that's where your opponent is going to go? If they're going to run a no policy, no platform campaign, how do you lay track to create a vulnerability around that? How do you turn that into an anchor, not a kite? And my argument is you got to start doing, you got to do it shrewdly and you have to do it well in advance of the writ dropping. And I don't think... I think the reason that people think that's such an attractive option is that nobody has shown yet that actually that that can be 
dismantled and proven to be a vulnerability. Someone will. I don't know if these guys will, but I'd be dedicating some energy to it because I'll bet a dollar that Pierre Polyev will run on a very thin platform for all these reasons. And I'd be thinking about how to use that against him. Well, on the you know, Scott, all this positioning stuff, all this positioning stuff you talk about takes us back really though to a tactic, which is I look at the shift in Polyev's numbers and the shift in conservative numbers since they put that advertising campaign on the air. And I think back to what Brian Topp told me about the Alberta election and how they found out that nobody heard anything that they were doing in earned media. And the only messages they got were from paid. Uh, media's over. Media's over. Yep. You've got to get on the paid airwaves. I agree with that strenuously. And it's a great time to be an old dinosaur because as that idea comes around, you find us waiting, sitting at the social club as old men. Hey, come on in. We'll tell, teach you how to do it again. Well, but on your point of needing to actually get those narratives out earlier, if, say, in the 11th hour of an election campaign, you put an ad on the air saying, soldiers in the streets, you know, it's going to be martial law if Stephen Harper is elected, then then that becomes the laugh track for uh, 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 for this hour as 22 minutes as opposed to a poignant political message. So, you know, uh, you got, uh, I, I agree with I'll you. I'll just take your you shot you and absorb it. I'll just take your <laughs> shot and absorb it with all the positive energy that I can. And I will reinforce your point by saying that the more desperate your political situation is, the less effective your negative advertising is. That's, That's the correct. argument I'm making. Yeah. So if you're gonna That's if you're gonna good. if you're gonna try to hit that, like you got to go rope a dope in the first round, not in the last, right? Yeah. So, all right, we yeah, got to move well, on. Okay, perfect. Yeah, Let's we go. got to move on. We got a clipping here from Christian Pass Lang at the CBC, which is based on an interview on the House. And boy, the House is a good program. A few people like public affairs should listen to that program. Um, here's a sec segment from the article. Immigration Minister Mark Miller says the concern around the skyrocketing number of international students entering Canada is not just about housing, but Canadians' confidence in the integrity of the immigration system itself. Canada is on track to welcome around 900,000, let me repeat this, 900,000 international students this year, Miller said in an interview that aired Saturday on CBC's The House. That's more than at any point in Canada's history and roughly triple the number of students who entered the country a decade ago. Miller said there were a number of illegitimate actors who were trying to exploit the system, which was eventually having a negative effect on people trying to come to Canada for legitimate reasons. He said he would not get involved with naming and shaming, but said his focus was on some private colleges Work would need to be done to tighten up the system, he said, to make sure institutions actually had space and suitable housing for people who were being admitted. Miller also said closer collaboration with provinces was key to solving the problem. And now, a quote from Polyev. We as conservatives will make sure that international students have homes, health care, and when they need it, job, when they want it, jobs so that we can get back to a system that supports our universities, attracts the world's brightest people, helps the demographics of our country, but does not leave people living in squalor, conservative leader Pierre Pauly have said. So, folks out there, hurly burlyites, this is our clipping because I think our collective spidey sense is tingling about the political undercurrents around immigration. It has a very intuitive link to the housing crisis, it's also the case that when economic times are bad and people are hurting themselves, they become less supportive of immigration. Yet no political party is picking up this mantle. Corey, do you think, I mean, the Paul F. quote's very telling. He does not want to blame immigration. Um, Corey, do you think this political consensus can hold in the face of crumbling pu if public support evaporates? Well, it's holding for now. I think over time, it's unlikely to. Uh, and I, I, I thought this was a good one for us to talk to because I was sort of gobsmacked that the first person to, to throw the anti-immigrant stone would be Miller and the Liberal Party. And, uh, I, and I, I, see, I see no good politics in that. I think it's intellectually dishonest uh, policy in a way, too. I would be naming and shaming if there's, you know, I, as I'm told, there are a handful of colleges that are are uh, going over the their prescribed limits with impunity, and they're basically 
operating in the dark margins of of this industry, which are you know are uh, constitute kind of quasi fraud. I'll even I point people towards I think the Walrus did like a uh, maybe six months ago a, a long expose of uh, this stuff. Uh, you know where you're you've got a village of people putting together enough money to get one student and off to a Canadian college. And it's like a scam college with a bullshit degree. And, uh, and they end up even more impoverished and in debt back in their home country. And it's, and it's essentially fraud, not essentially it is, it's fraudulent. Um, but I think there's also a culpability here in the part of the, the federal government in terms of them saying, oh, well, we let in a whole bunch of foreign students. And in this case, you know, three times as many as we were just a few years ago and with no plan to house them. No plan. Like these are areas where if the federal government wanted to actually engage on housing, they could do so. There's federal lands. They have the ability to contract and build federally. You know, why aren't we putting up? standing up housing for uh, for migrants? Why aren't we standing up housing for foreign students if we're going to let them in? What's the plan to house them? The government federally could take that on uh, you know, in its entirety and actually get some results on it. But instead, it's like, well, you know, uh, those immigrants, it's just such an unlikely message, especially for Miller, who I don't think that's like his his, uh, you know, natural set of values or whatever, but it just, you know, I don't think he sees how that sounds. I don't think he sees the danger for the Liberal Party in terms of looking like they're finger pointing at immigrants at a time where uh, Polyev's support among in immigrant communities across the country is going up. You know, you're, you're going to push even more people into, into the loving embrace of the Conservative Party and gosh, do I ever welcome them there. But I don't get why they would do it. Such a complicated issue, Scott. I mean, to me, the private colleges stuff, especially if they're bogus, doesn't seem complicated. But the university part of it seems very complicated because my understanding of this is, you know, basically provincial governments are not funding universities at the level that they used to fund them at. And so uh, they are, they've made up that funding shortfall. I mean, they charge these foreign students an exorbitant amount of money to go to these universities. And jack and the fees year after year after year because they realize it's an endless pump of cash. But if they didn't have it, the tuition fees well, at your at any of our alma maters, University of Regina, Queens, any of that would be unaffordable for, well, for, well, or, just, for Canadians. Just, just quickly on this, David, like the, the 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 other part of this is provinces not only are not funding them to the same level, but I think it's less about that. It's that they've they've imposed freezes on fees. So the only fees that you can raise in many jurisdictions, including Ontario, is is on foreign students. So uh, that ends up being the the piece that gets jacked, and the incentive is to bring in more foreign students. Now, look, overall, you know, the, you, the the ethical dilemma on this is you're doing a brain drain on on the developing world as opposed to anything else. But yeah, you know, is it a net positive for Canada? Goddamn right, it is. You know, we are we, you know we're basically siphoning off the smartest and most ambitious people from many of these 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 places that you know could really use those folks where they are now, but. You know, it's a huge benefit to Canada, but, you know, the fraudulent stuff isn't. And, you know, and there are, are uh, you know, issues that could be solved and the federal government could help solve them in terms of, of providing more funds to the university sector themselves, which they have in the past and have, have, you know, stepped back from over time. So, like, there are a lot of different policy fixes, but the politics on it, which is, I think, what we're more focused on, um, I think are very dangerous and it's only a matter of time before, before that, that consensus around immigration gets, you know, chipped away at to the point of it being something quite dangerous. Well, like Scott, let me just follow up on that with you. Like it's a weird question maybe, but if support for immigration declines and, you know, um, he gets mentioned negatively on this show. So let me mention him positively. Frank Graves has tracked this more than anybody else I know over decades. And there are periods of time where Canadians have been quite against uh, allowing a lot of people into the country. So if it becomes the consensus in Canada that we are through a combination of citizenship, refugees, temporary foreign workers and students, admitting too many people, and that's creating... Uh, meaning our kid, our own kids can't get houses or our own kids can't get this or that. And there's no expression of that in the legitimate political parties in Canada. Is this the opening that fucking Bernier's been looking for? Oh, well, we don't know. Um, I don't want to hyperventilate. I don't want to go into over-analysis about the prospects that the immigration consensus will necessarily break up. But I thought that last week was weird. 
Um, I thought that the twin uh, interventions uh, from Fraser, the former immigration minister, and Miller, the current immigration minister, I thought it was I, I thought it was odd. And and I, I to some degree, I know anecdote is not analysis, but to some degree, I I think there's probably a real issue there um, on international students. Like I. Uh, I think I may have told you, David, um, off mic, you know, when my oldest son was trying to find a new place, um, he was willing to pay enough that he didn't think he'd have a lot of trouble and he had a lot of trouble. And what happened was that even to rent a condo in the city of Toronto, in downtown Toronto, which is where he needed to be, um, he found that he was getting into bidding wars. And he was getting into bidding wars with international students. So what he was finding was that international students would show up and they would say to the agent, well, I'll pay the whole thing up front. I'll put, I, I won't put a down pay. I won't put first and last months. I'll put 12 months up front um, because they're being bankrolled by dad in, you know, in mainland China or India or wherever the heck they're coming from. And there's a bankroll there. And so um, over and over and over again, he'd say, Jesus Christ, I'm fucking getting clobbered here. And, you know, we ended up having to boost the down payment he would make and all that kind of stuff. So, um, but just as that's an odd story for me to tell about housing, I think this is an odd story for the federal government to tell about housing. Like I thought coming out of a cabinet retreat that they said was going to be principally about housing and bread and butter economics, I just thought it was strange. Can I stop you? Yeah. Can I stop you? Just break your train of thought for a second. Have you ever seen a worse job of framing an event than that? I, <laughs> I don't understand what they're trying to Have you ever seen a worse preconditioning effort I don't, on an event yeah. than that? I, I didn't see any evidence of preconditioning. Oh, we're going to talk about well, housing. No, there, was a, there, was, there was a evidence of preconditioning because, you know, some unnamed PMO source was out saying it's going to be about housing. Right. And, uh, we're having these guys come in. And, and, here, and here are the experts that are going to come in and talk to us. About us. And one of those experts, uh, I'll, I'll say with pride, listened last week. And uh, and basically agreed with me, Scott. So there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, hang on. And, and, the point and, you were and, making and, that agreed and, on and, you and, and, agreed and, with and, you and, about and is also, something I've agreed and, with you about. And and also said that that he basically fucking hates me. So you know, <laughs> even, even then, um, well, uh, he it, and it I agree out. on the issue. We agree about you. He and I are <laughs> yeah, in lockstep. Right. Oh, there's so much agreement here. Uh, but but look, I, at the end of that process, and I'll do another. Uh, you know, reference to Hurley Burley, like I listened with great interest to Wilkinson's uh, interview with you. I thought it was, uh, was he's a fan of this ways. show, by the way, that was really nice to hear yeah. from him. He's a fan that, of this yeah, show. That was nice. nice. And, he, and he appreciates my fashion choices around berets too. So yeah. that's good. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, but look at the end, the most revealing thing in that whole interview. And if you only have, you know, one minute to listen, listen to the last minute of that interview, because your final question really, I think, touched on on the failure of that retreat and the failure of this government more broadly, where you basically asked, what's your ballot question? And what you got back was this rambling, muddled, uh, you know, run-on sentence of, of incoherence. And, and, and it's not that Wilkinson's a, a, an unintelligent person. He's a very intelligent person. And I think one of the more capable ministers in that government. Uh, however, when asked, like, okay, so what are you running on? What's the ballot choice next election? It was blah, 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 blah. You know, it sounded like, you know, Daffy Duck. It was, you know, it was terrible. Can I just and, go back? I, I, agree, I agree with that, obviously. But can I just go back to this issue of, of international students specifically um, and how it was used as an apparent sword last week. And I, it felt to me uncoordinated and probably less strategic than they thought. So I wasn't surprised to hear Sean well, Fraser talk about it. Well, Miller disagreed with uh, Fraser. They were having a public debate yeah. between two men, well, two senior ministers of the cabinet were having in the newspaper, in the, in the media, a disagreement on a fundamental policy plank uh, that seemed improvised. It, it's like, you know, Miller out publicly musing about something, and then, you know, his public musings being slapped down by the housing minister who used to be the immigration minister. So, like, that's that's the kind of shit that, you know, you want to do behind closed doors. Well, this is in part where I'm going. So, I mean, just from my perspective. I'm, I'm going to stop interrupting you now. I'm just I, looking forward to tell I, you I I'm going to stop should. interrupting just keep, you. Just keep, just, <laughs> give me the cricket bat, see what happens. Do I continue to talk or do I bleed? Um, but... They go in, they say, housing, 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 that's going to be the focus. Fraser comes out. Fraser was on the Hurley Burley. 
just to keep self-referencing, right? And had raised this issue of international students, whatever it was, three months ago, right? Um, yep. So you know it was in the back of his mind. Those private colleges have been on his mind. When the fact that he spat that out at a microphone at the retreat, to me is a tell. And, and, and the tell is that they had nothing. Like they, they, they promoted this as being about this issue, but then they didn't have, and therefore we're going to do the following things. And I, I wasn't looking for a five point plan. I know that that wasn't going to emerge in the middle of the summer from a cabinet retreat, but at least some indication of now, how do we want to carry this message forward? Like, what do we say the process is? What are the steps? What are the, what, what are our particular points of anxiety or the places that we're going to concentrate on the, the, the notional goals we want to concentrate on? That wasn't laid out. That wasn't clear to cabinet ministers, obviously. It wasn't even clear i don't think the fraser so fraser comes out he goes back to the greatest hits his needle drop on international students and private colleges that's where i think it came from so then you got miller out on it but you knew it wasn't coordinated because pmo was also they kind of shied away in a couple things they're sort of like well hang on hang on then you had stakeholders from the colleges and universities come out and as far as this prime minister's office is concerned stakeholder groups are the public Right. And so they uh, they get some pushback from stakeholder groups. The province of Quebec goes, stay the fuck out of our immigration policy. OK, bugger off. And so you end up in this situation where um, it looks it looks incoherent. Then Miller jumps in. Right. And 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 up Andy. And so one, uh, I think it's uncoordinated messaging on the issue that they themselves say is of greatest significance. So it means that they didn't have a message strategy. And that's not sharp. That's not wise. Second, as Corey points out, it's a strange thing to bring up because you're tattling on yourself, right? If this is a failure, well, you've permitted the failure to arise and or you have failed to compensate for this policy. Um, and I don't know which is the right approach to, to cap it or to create policies that uh, allow us to continue to grow that ca uh, that quota, but that you do things to, to provide for those folks. I also think it's an fucking odd place to start the housing discussion because although it is important and it's clearly a threat in this sweater it seems like a very peculiar slightly off bullseye place for a lot of people who are like yeah uh, so I, i'm i was wondering if my rent could be cheaper i was hoping i could have um, my kids buy a house without a down payment of four hundred thousand dollars so you know like it just seemed an odd way into it and so when you put it all together, you go, guys, like if this is your principal political preoccupation, then like you got to do better. And I think Sean Fraser is wildly talented, as you know, and I think Mark Miller is a super smart guy. Um, but I think what's really what the whole and thing Wilkinson's, is. A and Wilkinson's a fantastic, too, in my judgment, and yes. his portfolio. Outstanding. But you know what? None of these people are being told what the fucking political That's strategy is. That's my point. There's this no is a government without a political strategy. strategy. These people are out there swimming without, without so an like idea of where they're going. they finally got the memo that housing is the problem and they can't say it's not a federal problem. And so they decide to say, yes, we're going to focus on it. But then nobody says, okay, so then what's the, less, what's the next sentence? And not not not... Like, not the full answer, but what's the next sentence that carries us towards some sort of political positive outcome? And so people are improvising. And then you end up, now we have a national debate about international students that I don't think the government necessarily meant to provoke or is yeah. ready from a policy standpoint yeah. to manage. Or 100%. is politically going to benefit from. Uh, like, it, it's, 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 a, it's a weird one for them to put in the window. The other thing... Just speaking of waiting, we got to move on. We got to okay. move on because speaking of benefiting... <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of benefiting, there have been new developments in the Green Belt issue since we last spoke as a group. The major ones are the resignation of the chief of staff to the housing minister and the referral for potential investigation from the OPP to the RCMP. The latter issue has allowed media to use the word criminality, and it's popping up in most stories, and that is a horrible, horrible word to be associated with you politically. My feeling, just to lead off this conversation... My feeling is that the Ford government's actually doing pretty well on the we need to build message. And if it were unencumbered by the specter of favoritism, the green belt might not be that much of an issue, the actual building on the green belt. I think that the housing issue is big enough. The Ford government is establishing its bona fides. I think most Ontarians don't care that much about that in the face of the problem. On the But the problem is... Ford is losing the argument on the process of how the land was allocated decisively, I think. 
And I think this could stick. It's always hard to judge what's going to stick to politicians these days, and especially Ford. He's got a unique kind of relationship with people. People have a, a sense of him. Maybe this won't uh, damage him, but I think it's too on the nose for what people always kind of suspected about him. And I think this may stick. Scott, how would you help Ford get out of this mess? Well, I think... Uh, I don't. I don't think there's easy answers. I think that ultimately they're going to be victim to uh, process, and that's that's what's really. There are two unpleasant things about last week for the Ford government. One is that um, it it the the specific reference from the OPP to the RCMP provokes people into saying investigation, criminality, potential for criminal charges. And the RCMP quickly scrambled to issue a second statement, sort of indicating, well, we're just doing an assessment. But as the former OPP commissioner, Chris Lewis, pointed out, the OPP probably didn't make the referral to the RCMP because they concluded there was nothing worth looking at. So you can intuit, but that's just speculation. But it, it, it creates new process. And you still got the ethics, uh, the integrity commissioner, I should say. You still got that report hanging over you. You've got uh, this investigation, potential investigation, assessment investigation. And I think that the Ford government is doing the best they can, which is, you know, to hammer away that the core issue is, look, we got to get stuff done. We got to get stuff built. Uh, and the problem is that that leaves them victim uh, to the process. I don't think, for example, David, that, they, that they'll be beneficiaries of calling some independent inquiry to say, see, we have no worries about it. That's the last thing I would recommend at this point, to be honest with you, um, because that's just going to create another process and uh, and more demands for, uh, you know, emails and DMs and PMs and so forth. So I think the truth of the matter is, I do think this is a serious issue. I think when cronyism and corruption start to get thrown around a government, they can stick to you. And if they do, then that's that's dangerous. And they may not kill you in the first pass, but they can hunt you down eventually. And I think of, you know, uh, you know, I think of that O'Bears that stuck around uh, Chrétien for years and people said it had no effect. But sponsorship, by the time sponsorship came a call in, you know, they had gone to the body enough that he dropped his hands and got hit in the face. So um, I, I think it's I think it's really dangerous for them. And um, I was puzzled by the decision to let go a motto. I was really puzzled by that because to me, um, you know, just two days before they had signaled uh, like a prideful sort of story that the premier or himself personally intervened, that he wanted to stand by the guy and not let him have his job. Then on the eve of finding out this, the files being referred to the RCMP, he suddenly leaves. I don't know, man. That sure feels like smoke to me, but, you know, we'll have to see if there's any fire. Corey, what do you think? Uh, well, not not very much different than what I said uh, last week. Like, I think the key for for Ford on this and the Ford government is to keep the focus on on building more housing and and the need to do that. And uh, I think the message is: look, uh, we were elected on a on a platform of getting it done, of getting housing built, getting transit built, getting highways built, getting hospitals and long term care built. And we're going to do that. And look, uh, not everyone's going to like every decision or every process or lack of consultation here or arbitrary decision making over there. Uh, but that's how you actually get shit done quickly. And at the end of the day, if we have to choose between everyone being happy with every decision and and actually honoring the the larger theme of what your your election platform was based on, you're better to go with the latter. You're better to to honor that larger election commitment of getting shit done. And so, like, I, I think that's the path out. You know, uh, look, the X factor in all of this is if there's a police investigation, do they find anything of merit? Uh, and if they do, then you've got a whole world of trouble. Um, but if they don't, then, you know, you move on. And yeah, you, you know, I, I agree with you that these things are cumulative over time. Uh, but I think if, if, if Ford has one superpower, it's the ability to course correct uh, with, with minimal damage. And we've seen that time and time again with him. And, and it harkens to, I think, the, the other politician, I'd say, who shared that same superpower to the same level was Ralph Klein, you know, where you can just say, oh, geez, you know, uh, shouldn't have said that, shouldn't have done that, not doing that anymore. And and able to sort of sidestep it uh, to a degree that most politicians are unable to. But he so. would just to follow up a bit. He would change though. He would drop policies. Like he would change when he ran into pushback. He wouldn't plow through and say, "Well, I'm sorry I did that, but fuck it, I did it." He would change it. 
Yeah, well, you can change things on a go forward basis, but like, and, you know, we'll see what happens with these green belt lands over time. Like there's basically a foot race to develop. And if, if, if some people don't develop, then the land goes back into the green belt. And I, I would say that's not a bad outcome from a politics standpoint. If some people don't cross that threshold to, to lose uh, those, uh, uh, those changes, because I think it, it then points to the motive actually being correct and being around housing. So, you know, we'll see what happens. Like, I, I think there are too many cards left to, to, to be revealed on the table to, to know exactly where everything's going on, on, on these things. But, you know, it, it's my absolute uh, belief that uh, in terms of, the, of the, the premier, like his motive is, in my view, beyond question. And the thought that there's any, any chicanery, uh, you know, involving him, I, I would say that the, the probability is zero. So, you know, I think that... But true, that, true as that might be, you can't expect people to believe that, right? Because they don't know him the way you know him, right? So they just can go by what they, what they see, and it, yeah. looks, it looks suspicious. Here's what I think Ford could get away with right now. I think Ford could get away with saying, you know, I really wasn't on top of this process the way, it should, have, the way I should have been, and it looks like it wasn't proper. Uh, we do need well, to build, and we need to build on these green belt lands right away. So let's redo this process really quickly. Uh, put a pro- put some people together that meet some smell test, and uh, do the land allocations again. And then I think you know, I I, I, well, I think the green belt the, the, fight's kind of won. Yeah, well, like I, I think on on developing parts of the green belt, the public is there. You know, at least in all the research I've seen. But where they're not there is is around some of the process stuff. You're you're right, but you know, I think he's said a version of that message already in terms of accepting most of the all but one of the uh, recommendations from the AG. Um, but it's you just know, the one about we'll reversing see. the process. I, I, well, no, I, I, but, it's but all about doing it all, but. It's that's easy, easily said, and very difficult to do because you know you've now have changes and values of this land, and you know, and then everything's opened up, and you've got uh, something where you're only talking about the green belt for the next two years, maybe three. And I, I don't think uh, talking about the green belt is where where the votes and where the public interest is. I think building housing is where the votes and the public interest is, and you want to get off the green belt and onto that. And and the way to do that is to not you know open a, an inquiry or open a new process or, you know, redo the decision from square one, because I think that is a guarantee that you only talk about the green belt. And that's, you know, in my view, the wrong thing to do. I would add cool. two quick things. One, I think the opposition have been less effective than they should be. $8.3 billion. They're all conflicted. $8.3 billion dollars looks like it's been uh, made available uh, in terms of that. That's the interest that's 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 been put on the table. I would be saying $8.3 billion, $8.3 billion. The sponsorship billion, billion. program is absolute chump change compared to that. Absolute chump change. Well, well, just, well, it's know, barely you know, beer and popcorn yeah. money for Chris. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, boy. Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go there. Uh, I went pound away. Come on, I had million. to take soldiers in the streets today. Yeah, oh, fuck, yeah. I was there too. Wait a minute, so I should get a double dose of shit? Hey, let's get rid of the notwithstanding clause where we're at it. Just I still think that's every, the right idea. Every, every Hail um, Mary in there all at once. But the opposition should be pounding away on Nobody will ever say I quit, Corey. They should be stapling $8.3 billion to the government. The second thing is, and this is the if, but if, if... There are investigations, either through the Integrity Commissioner or the RCMP or both, that demonstrate the people in and around Ford made money off of this stuff. Then that, I think, will diminish his ability to Ralph Klein this thing away. Because at that point, then you get into this cronyism, corruption, and that gets very dangerous territory politically and uh, sort of doing the ah shucks thing. And so as difficult as, you know, I, the reason he's not reversing the process is A, he doesn't want to reverse the process and B, reversing the process will open you up presumably to a ton of litigation from those developers who, you know, presumably are sitting on a war chest of $8.3 billion with which they can pay expensive lawyers. So uh, they probably don't want to go down that path, um, but they may be forced to at some point. Well, All right. I, I, th- I think I think there's a lot more cards to be played, including on on the policy side uh, around this stuff like the. You know, I, I do encourage everyone to listen to that uh, hurly burly with Jennifer Keysmat, where she wears the critic of the Ford government and then, you know, quickly changes into her developer hat and basically confirms every, assess- every assertion he's made around the problems <laughs> in development. Uh, but look, I, there, there are challenges with the developers, for sure, you know, where 
the value that's accrued in the market by changing the designation of land is more important than actually building housing and that you get people who you know get get permission to build and then they either flip that land or they sit on it and wait for it to accrue an even greater value and they do everything except build the fucking homes that they were you know that the government expects them to and so i think there's a lot of things that can be done that the development community is probably not going to universally applaud but i think the public will because they're, they are part of the opportunity in terms of solving the housing problem, and they're part of the fucking problem, too. And, uh, you know, you got to be using a series of both carrots and sticks, I think, throughout this system, whether it's municipalities or developers, uh, if you want to get anything done. All right. Well, that was a great insight into the going forward political strategy. Thanks, Corey. It was really interesting. <laughs> um, all right, Mr. Pinsent, can you bring this rollicking session to some sort of respectable conclusion, please? Ladies and gentlemen, please return to your seats. The Hey You's are about to begin. All right, who's got a Hey You? I got one. Uh, here you go. I'll jump out. Uh, my Hey You is to uh, David and my old boss, Paul Martin, turns 85 today, so we want to wish Mr. Martin a happy birthday. And I just want to say, I just want to say, take a look at what this guy was all about at the time. At the fucking time, New Deal for Cities, a deal on health care, right? a uh, Kelowna Accord to deal with uh, basic services for Indigenous people and Indigenous reconciliation, obviously dealing uh, with the National Child Care Program, right? on and on and on. He's talking about climate, obviously using a surplus to finance uh, you know, government services, but also to shove the Federation in a direction he wanted it to go. I just think you look at those things, um, he was right. He was right. He was right. He was right. Happy birthday. Excellent. Love it. Corey, what do you got? Bill Blair. Really? Hey, you, hey you Bill Blair. We saw, uh, actually, I think it's in, in the media this morning, that uh, a memo to the RCMP months old about uh, it's time to apologize and accept responsibility for uh, the uh, terrible situation uh, that occurred in Nova Scotia with the mass shooting there and the incompetence demonstrated by the RCMP again and again and again throughout that terrible night and the next day. And and how none of that's happened. And so, you know, I when we were talking cabinet shuffle, I put out there that Bill Blair was the absolute embodiment of a past its prime government and put in a position in a role where uh, he never should be. You know, you never want to have cops in charge of the cops or generals in charge of defense or, you know, whenever you get into that situation, it generally come, it goes badly for you. But this past its prime, uh, weak cabinet minister, uh, now has an opportunity to actually step up and do something correct here. So he's in charge of, of the department, in charge of the RCMP, in, uh, you know, on a policy basis in an appropriate way, and get them to go out and fucking apologize already. Uh, so, hey, you Bill Blair, time to, to prove me wrong and go and do your fucking job. There you go. There you go. All right. My hey you goes out to liberal leadership candidate Bonnie Crombie, the mayor of Mississauga. Um this green belt issue is you have to assume the biggest vulnerability the Ford government will face in this term. It is key to uh, changing uh, liberal and conservative political fortunes. You are ideally suited as the mayor of Mississauga, as somebody that's responsible for building houses, as somebody that's on the edge of the green belt. To take a big stick to Ford on this and lead the fight against him. You get media attention. Ford responds to what you say. This is your moment, and it's your moment to do this for the Liberal Party. So step up and lead the charge on the Green Belt. Hey, you. All right, that's our show for today. I'd like to thank everybody who watched or listened. Thank you, all you uh, curse, uh, curse it out there. I'd like to thank Corey and Scott for showing up, and no thanks to Jordan for not ah. showing up. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd like to thank our presenting sponsor, TELUS, and our sponsor, CN Rail. See you next week, and in the meantime, take care of yourselves. <laughs>